Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture. My name is Jesse Day and on this show we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the CEO of Kraken Energy, Mr. Matthew Schwab. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. We love uranium on this show, so it's always great to get different perspectives. But I want to start off like I do with all new guests, which is the origin story. So for yourself, what drew you to the uranium space? And then what is the road from there that led you to becoming the CEO of a uranium company? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I've been in uranium since the start of my career, really. Uh, from a summer student straight through till now, I've had a lot of... Uh, Great opportunities and experiences, and, and of course some hurdles, but that's all part of the fun. I've been in the mineral exploration and mining industry since 2009, and I was very fortunate to start off working with Hathor Exploration. And that was through the development of the Rough Rider deposit and then the subsequent sale to Rio Tinto for $654 million back in 2011. Uh, following that, I did a short stint with Rio Tinto before I, I looked again into the junior exploration space. And I ended up accepting a job with the newly founded company NextGen Energy. Shortly after making that move, I was the senior exploration geologist at the time of targeting and discovery of the Aero Uranium deposit. And again, had the fortune of being part of another great success story that I'm sure most of you have heard of in the uranium space. Uh, after my departure from NextGen, I shifted within the industry a bit and I started a few successful private consulting firms. Initially, I was dealing with upstream oil and gas exploration in Western Canada. But my most recent venture prior to Kraken was as co-founder of Axiom Exploration Group, which was a much larger international consulting firm that provided uh, geological, environmental, and geophysical consulting services worldwide. Though I guess in the theme of my career, I eventually needed a new challenge, and I was presented with the opportunity to join Kraken by our chairman and my previous co-worker, Garrett Ainsworth. As you know, through the last half of 2022, there was a really clear trend in the junior market and the uranium space overall. So it was a rather easy decision on my part, and it's really been an exciting five months so far. Great. Well, I want to switch over to uranium and nuclear power and talk about how we're starting to see more and more acceptance of nuclear energy across the board. People are starting to realize that if you really want a carbon neutral or a lower carbon future, which a lot of governments seem to be pushing towards, you really have to have nuclear power. Um, there are a few outliers like Germany, of course, Belgium, a few of them. Hopefully, as the years go by, they will reverse course. But I'm wondering, when we look forward, let's say 10 years into the future, where do you see the nuclear industry globally? Well, you know, it, it's interesting how often this question gets asked. And it's even more interesting how the answer really hasn't changed over the past 10 years. We've known for a long time that uranium is the most logical option for an alternative to our reliance on hydrocarbon use. Uh, but most people also knew that there was no way to realistically stop using hydrocarbons overnight anytime in the near future. So as nations around the world are more increasingly pushed towards green initiatives and alternative energy sources, both society and governments are finally beginning to realize that this is the only path forward. 2022 was the biggest contracting year for uranium since 2011 and the disaster of Fukushima, and we're continuing to see a lot of big deals being made and being made over longer terms to lock up uranium supply. So in 10 years, I think the nuclear industry should be well on its way to being the most prevalent aspect of energy, energy production and supply worldwide. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you there. Um, this is interesting. Oliver Stone has a new movie out called Nuclear Now with an exclamation mark. He really wants nuclear, so that's great. Um, he, was, he recently screened it at the World Economic Forum, and uh, I want to read a quote from an article about it in the New York Times. It says, For Mr. Stone, nuclear is the only existing technology that could help meaningfully bring down carbon emissions from energy, and its danger has been drastically overstated. Even in light of disasters like the failure failure of the Fukushima power plant in 2011, what are your thoughts there? Because that is kind of the I, I get comments on my YouTube channel all the time. You know, I have a documentary on nuclear energy, and a lot of the time, people leave these sorts of comments. Remember Fukushima? Remember Three Mile Island, Chernobyl? These these disasters. Some of them not even very bad, like Three Mile Island in the past. So, what what are your thoughts there on that statement about Oliver Stone and his movie? And, and obviously, this is a great thing. Um, having having such a mainstream, you know, director come out and release a film like this, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I fully agree with that statement, to be honest. It's always amazed me how much impact social misconception regarding uranium has had an effect on the uranium market. And Canada is a prime example, where a country has some of the largest and highest grade uranium reserves on the planet, but nuclear power only contributes about 15% of the country's power supply, while petroleum, coal, and natural gas continue to contribute over 70% of the nation's power supply. And really, this has been largely due to the feedback from society being opposed to the construction of nuclear reactors. And it's all based on those previous and historic accidents that happened, regardless of the impact that they actually had. So how can we progress and move away from hydrocarbon reliance if infrastructure development is hindered by misinformation? And, and really, as, as we continue to move forward and aim to lower our carbon footprint, education and publicity that properly inform society about the benefits of nuclear power versus the very minimal realistic risks is a critical part of the process. Yeah, definitely. Now, obviously, we're we're talking about uranium here. And if you believe in the future of nuclear, uranium is obviously an important part of that. So could you talk to us about right now, what makes uranium an attractive sector to potentially invest in, in your view? Yeah, um, as far as uh, uranium being important, uh, the answer is pretty straightforward. Yes, nuclear power is the future of energy production. And until the time that another source of fuel, such as thorium, maybe becomes cost effective and has the infrastructure in place to become viable, uranium is really the only option to supply our reactors with fuel and, and keep the lights on around the world. What, what are you seeing in the supply demand fundamentals out there? Because, you know, some people are saying there's plenty of uranium to go around, but most of that is still in the ground that that's needed. So obviously there's an incentive price needed to bring that out of the ground. So is, is that a big part of the thesis for you? And what are some of the other things um, that you think make it good to invest in? You know, honestly, the, the production and demand is, is not in line. Um, as countries keep moving, like I said, towards these green initiatives, so demand keeps going up and supply just isn't there because production isn't going up worldwide. Sure, we have plenty of reserves around the planet, but as demand increases and supply becomes harder to secure, we have to focus on increasing that production internationally, domestically, across the board, because we're going to come up with a shortage. It's inevitable unless those things change. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, so I want to touch on jurisdiction for a moment, because that's very important, obviously, in any resource industry. So in your opinion, which jurisdictions are, are the most ideal uh, for the mining and exploration of uranium? Well, of course, jurisdiction is very important to both exploration and mining efforts around the world. And we need to factor in so many different things, such as you know, safety, accessibility, infrastructure, cost, and then political stability, and of course, public opinion. So many jurisdictions have a wealth of mineral reserves that are essentially untouchable due to these factors, right? And we need to weigh out these risks to determine if at any point our time, effort, and money is going to be completely wasted due to a project not moving forward. So in saying that, weighing out all the options, uh, even in nations that meet all of our criteria, certain states, provinces, and territories are still against uranium specifically just due to public opinion. So kind of summarizing all of that, in my mind, the most ideal jurisdictions for development of uranium projects right now currently, I would say Saskatchewan, Wyoming, Nevada, and maybe Western Australia. Right. And speaking to which, uh, do you think it's becoming more important for countries to source their uranium locally? Because we're, the U.S. derives 20% of its electricity from nuclear energy, and yet there isn't a single mine producing any notable amount of uranium in the whole country in terms of publicly traded companies or even even private companies that I'm aware of. This is something that has to be addressed at some point, right? For sure. And, you know, the short answer to that, that has to be addressed. Absolutely. Um, as nations continue to secure larger and longer term uranium supply contracts, any country out there that requires tens of millions of pounds of uranium annually is just inherently at a higher risk of not being able to satisfy that demand by relying on international supply. Not unless, like I said previously, your worldwide production just increases, right? And of course, these risks were highlighted last year by the conflict overseas, with over 50% of the world's uranium production in 2022 coming from Russia and ex-Soviet states. Uh, that's a huge risk factor. So if nations like the U.S., who require 50 plus million pounds of uranium per year for that 20% of their energy production, 
want to reduce risk and secure fuel for their energy needs, domestic uranium production is a critical factor. Yeah, absolutely. And and when you're mentioning there the amount of uranium that comes from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, R- Russia is a much smaller percentage of that. But it's kind of curious to see where will they fall in, in what many are calling the new Iron Curtain, right? Because you also have China, you know, who is also mining uranium in Kazakhstan and getting closer to Russia on the geopolitical stage. So I think that's going to be very interesting to see how that all turns out and paints a picture where it's more important than ever for for countries to domestically source their uranium. So when it comes to investing, in your opinion, how should the average investor approach the uranium sector? Because there's companies obviously across the risk spectrum from early stage exploration, explorers with discoveries, developers, producers, we've got the ETFs. Is it important for investors to be diversified amongst the different stages of production, those different companies? Yeah, you know, that really, of course, depends on the type of investor you're talking about and what their risk tolerance is. Personally, I've always been a fan of investing in early stage junior explorers, and that's just generally due to the more significant upside potential, right? But with so many more uranium juniors trading in our current market, I I can really see how evaluating which companies are the safest can be a daunting task for most investors. So yes, while diversification is definitely important, I, I think more importantly, weighing out the stage of exploration or proximity to known deposits or even just the general comfort factor is a big part in that decision-making process. Um, And in saying that, something that we've done at Kraken is to focus on properties that have past producing assets, assets, which allows us to start exploration at a brownfield stage and minimize much of the initial risk that's involved with those early stage junior explorers while still retaining that upside potential for investors. That's great. Yeah, well, let's let's pivot to Kraken Energy on that note. So you, you gave us a little flavor of it there, but maybe for those not familiar with the story, maybe you could give us the overview of the company and, and what you guys are doing. For sure. Yeah. So as I just mentioned, Kraken has focused on building up an exploration strategy around creating a portfolio of high value properties that fit a specific set of criteria, including past production, regionally high grade uranium and existing infrastructure. So We've currently got three properties in Nevada, including Apex, Garfield Hills, and Huber Hills. All three properties were past producers of uranium in Nevada. They're accessible year-round, boast historic grades or production grades of over 0.2% U308 average, and host multiple uranium occurrences across each of the properties. So as we continue to advance our projects and build our, our property portfolio, our real end goal is to prove up an economically feasible hub-and-spoke mining model for uranium production in the U.S. Nice. So let's talk about your latest press release. Kraken Energy reports positive soil sampling results at Apex Uranium Property, Nevada. Break that down for us in, in, in layman's terms. What does that mean um, for, for the work that you're doing there and, uh, and for the company moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. So we're trying to advance all of our projects concurrently to try and uh, get them to the same stage at the same point as we add new projects to the portfolio. The Apex mine was historically the largest producing uranium mine in Nevada, and we're really excited to continue exploring the new property, which is now a total of 3,900 hectares. Um, With this most recent soil sample survey, we've confirmed multi-element anomalies across the across the, the original mine portion that include uranium, gold, silver, nickel, and copper. And this really only adds to the vast potential of the property. So now that we've confirmed the radiometric anomalies outlined by our recently completed airborne surveys do correlate with the soil anomalies, our possible drill targets are quickly multiplying. Um, We're going to be planning to complete additional soil grids over the various radiometric anomalies on the property through the summer of 2023. And, And personally, I can't wait to see what we learn from those results. Maybe you could speak a little bit to the the team behind Kraken Energy. Um, and anybody notable involved and, and what's the experience of the team um, that, that, that makes them right for the company and for the project you're working on? For sure, Jesse. Um, you know, one of the big selling points uh, of me coming over to Kraken was the team that was already assemb- assembled around the company. Our chairman, Garrett Ainsworth, he's got an amazing track record in the uranium space and, and outside of that as well. And we, we also brought on as advisors, uh, Troy Beaujolais and Galen McNamara, who were both parts of uh, Next Gen Energy and Cameco in the past. And we're slowly building that out as well with additions like our new senior geologist, Madeline Berry, who has a strong history of uranium exploration in, in Saskatchewan from Next Gen as well. So what I like to see is bringing together these people that have 
seen all the different stages of a junior company progressing from greenfields to discovery through uh, feasibility and, and beyond that because everybody in, understands each part of the process. They understand um, the fallbacks and, and the benefits to doing it right. And, and I really think we're on, on track to do the, the, the same thing over again that we've done so many times in our past. Well, for those who want more information on Kraken Energy, what's the best place to go online? Is it the website? Do you have a social media account? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's most or all of those essentially. For anyone looking to find out more about Kraken Energy, you can visit our website or you can visit the various social media platforms that we're using. Uh, those include Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And, and of course, we trade on the CSE as UUSA and the OTCQB as UUSAF. Great. Well, I'll put links to the website and Twitter in the description below so you guys can check that out. I actually like what you guys are doing with your social media account. You're actually on site taking videos. So I think that's very fascinating for, for investors to take a look at. One of the few companies that actually kind of opens, pulls the curtain back and, and, and shows you and shows what you guys are doing there on site. So I think that's very cool. Well, thank you for so much for joining us today, Matthew, and I uh, hope to have you back on again to continue the conversation, maybe get an update later this year. For sure, Jesse. Thank you for having me. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.